Ecclesiastes chapter 8 as we continue our journey through this interesting, powerful, transformative book we call Ecclesiastes. Um, there have been times along this journey where as the pastor of Crossroads, I have said, wow, um, who do I have to blame for this Ecclesiastes teaching series? And then I reflect for a nanosecond and I realize that that's my fault. That's me. Um, but I'm glad we're doing it. It's just hard sometimes. In fact, it was particularly hard this week because we're on Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Some of the books that I have that I've been looking at to help me out in studying this Old Testament book, uh, I discovered this week, just kind of skip over chapter 8 in terms of their own study. It's sort of like, this is hard. And so they said, I'm going to just go ahead and skip that. Um, I found that very unhelpful as a pastor, so I grabbed another book and tried to find someone who has something to say about Ecclesiastes chapter 8. And for even the people that had something to say about Ecclesiastes chapter 8, I read it and I'm just like, you know what, I'm just going to study Ecclesiastes chapter 8, I'm going I'm to hear what these people say, but uh, I just need to pray. <laughs> um, as I always do when I'm preparing a message, I just need to pray. Uh, this is a hard text. There are uh, incredibly relevant things that will emerge because God's word is relevant. Uh, I don't have to make this practical, right? This is practical. But sometimes there are difficult, challenging passages where we have to dive deep, get a sense of what the original context of this passage is, and then extrapolate to our world today in 2022 in Auburn, Florida. And so I'm trusting that through the power of the Spirit, God's going to speak to you, and I'm praying the same for me. I want you to look at Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 1. And this is like a preface verse that is going to have a little sermon of its own. Verse 1 says, Who's like the wise? Who knows the explanation of things? A person's wisdom brightens their face and changes its hard appearance. A person's wisdom brightens their face. And changes its hard appearance. I sent an email this week to some of the adults that work with the youth at this church. Specifically, students that work in the Jam 45, working with 4th and 5th graders. Uh, we did an event recently and just kind of gathered together with these students and had some fun and just tried to build some relationships. And the following day, one of the students came to church, and um, this student's countenance was, was different. I could, I could see God working in this student's life. And I've talked to Nathan Smith recently about some other students that visually you can see God is working in their hearts, changing them from the inside out. And when God's working on a person, this verse is so true. The countenance changes. When someone loves Jesus with all their heart, they look different. And when you see a teenager who loves Jesus and is seeking to live according to the ways of Christ and his word as opposed to the darkness of this world, the person's going to look lighter and brighter than the world. And I've been praying over our teenagers and our pre-teenagers because the world that they experience on a daily basis, as we know, is incredibly dark. And yet God has a mission for them to be the light in the dark places where he takes them. A person's wisdom brightens their face and changes its hard appearance. There is empirical evidence to the reality of Christ's resurrection. It has changed hearts, it has transformed minds, and it is, I would argue, changed faces. And so we as followers of Jesus have the honor, the privilege, and also the responsibility to live with transformed hearts, transformed minds, but also changed faces. Some of the people you see this week are going to need to see joy reflected on your face so that they can know the reality of the God who lives within you. The power of a transformed facial appearance 
for the glory of God. Sermonette over because verse 1 doesn't fully apply to where I'm going. Everybody got the sermonette? There's power there in that verse. I love it. Here we go. Um, I want you to go to verse 17. Second verse sentence of 17. Here's where we're going to start. We're going to start at the end. Some of you love to start at the end. Some of you hate to start at the end. We're going to start at the end because this kind of sums up where we're going. No one can comprehend what goes on under the sun. No one. As you watched the news this past week, you tried to make sense of what you saw. You can't understand it. I can't understand it. Presidents, rulers of countries today can't fully understand it. We can understand certain aspects of it. We know evil when we see it. But in terms of understanding the full story of what's going on, what's unfolding, you can't get to the bottom. And I can't either. Solomon goes on to say, despite all their efforts to search it out, no one can discover its meaning. Even if the wise claim they know, they cannot really comprehend it. So I think it's very interesting that with our sequence of study, um, I had planned on teaching on Ecclesiastes chapter 8 many months ago. And with as much as I've struggled with this passage in light of what's going on in the world today, I'm like, wow, God's timing really is perfect. And God really is sovereign, not only of all over all of the events of the world, but also over our teaching series here at this church and, and what we're focusing on in this moment, on this day. And so the title of this teaching is, what is going on? <laughs> Because over the past few years, we have all wondered, what is going on? And Ecclesiastes teaches us, you can't know fully. Ecclesiastes teaches us that I can't know fully. But the question then becomes, where do we go from there? Do we slip into some kind of worldly despair and say, oh, I can't figure anything out. I guess I'll just throw up my hands and just crawl into a hole. Not at all. Not at all. The reality that we cannot know fully what is going on is an impetus for you and for me to humble ourselves in the presence of the Almighty God who alone knows, who alone is over it all, and somehow working his sovereign plan through it all in a way that we can't understand, but in a way that we are called to trust. I've been reading through this A.W. Tozer book, Knowledge of the Holy, that I told you about a few weeks ago, and I read another quote of his this week. He says, left to ourselves, we tend immediately to reduce God to manageable terms. Uh, you have a temptation on a regular basis to try and manage God, to try and control him and put him in your situation in a way that you want God to be in your situation. And how can I say that? Because I try to do the same thing. We're all in this together. Tozer goes on to say, we want to get him where we can use him, or at least know where he is when we need him. We want a God we can, in some measure, control. So a part of Ecclesiastes is, remember, as I prayed a few minutes ago, it comes out of the text that we studied recently, God's in heaven, sovereign over everything. We're on earth. Solomon says, let your words be few. There is a time and a place to stand in awe of a holy God and to be okay, really okay, with not knowing, of being okay really okay with trusting in God's power and greatness in the midst of the struggle. 
And this is what Ecclesiastes is essentially about at its core. And so before I plan to go through Ecclesiastes, um, the world seemed to be in a different place. Now the world seems to be in a much different place than when I said, let's study Ecclesiastes. But the same God who was God when I decided to study this book is the same God who's God on the throne now. And he will be the same God who's on the throne tomorrow and every day into all eternity. The question is, how are we as a church going to respond to this? And I would argue that this passage is here for many reasons, but one of which is to drive us to our knees. In recognition that he's in heaven, we're here. He's God, we're not. He's our savior. We are the sheep of his pasture who are prone to wander every day and do wander many times. By his grace, he brings us back and we come back when we're humble when our hearts are broken for what we see in this world, and instead of becoming anxious, we pray. When our hearts are saddened by the destruction and the evil that we see, but instead of fretting, we say, God, I'm gonna trust you. I'm gonna be a person of faith. And as a community of faith, we need to be, and continue to be, a community of faith, right? A community of faith is a community of faith. Never a community of fear. And a community of faith is one that doesn't try and manage God and take control of God because we can never do that. Anyway, we throw up our hands not in despair but in worship. We come to Christ with open hands, allowing him to move in our lives in a profound, transformational way. And we just say, Lord, may your will be done in my life. May your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Ecclesiastes reminds us of all of this. But we struggle. We're human beings, right? We struggle with this. And so I'm going to highlight three struggles that we have in our lives and how God wants us to trust him in the midst of those particular struggles. And here's what we're going to do. We're also going to have a approximately a 60-second time of silent prayer in between each point this morning. So I'm going to make a point. We're just going to stop. You're going to close your eyes. I'm going to close mine, and we're just going to be silent, and we're going to pray and ask the Lord to give us renewed faith and confidence in him in the midst of the struggle for that particular point. So here we go. Point number one is this. God wants us to trust him when we are struggling with people who are in authority in our lives in different capacities. It's very interesting that verse 2 of Ecclesiastes chapter 8 starts talking about kings, those who are in authority over nations. And in particular, some scholars believe that this was written post-Solomon time. All right, There's scholarly debate on this, but it's kind of interesting to speculate. Some scholars think that this is at a time when the people of Israel were overwhelmed with other nations, other nations coming in and taking control and ruling over them and their subsequent struggle as a result of that. It's very interesting, that particular possible interpretation in light of this past week. So Solomon says in verse 2, Obey the king's command, I say, because you took an oath before God. He recognizes that there is a place for earthly kingly authority. All right? So we are instructed as followers of Jesus Christ to, to pray for those who are in governmental authority over us. Verse 3, Do not be in a hurry to leave the king's presence. Do not stand up for a bad cause, for he will do whatever he pleases. Since a king's word is supreme... Who can say to him, what are you doing? So he's saying the authority of rulers is large and it's big. And life goes better when we do what rulers say. But there is a caveat in scripture, right? We are called to obey God over other authorities. And so there may come a time 
for followers of Jesus Christ to follow God rather than men or rulers and authorities. And so in verse 5, it's very interesting. He says, whoever obeys his command will come to no harm. In other words, it doesn't make sense to rebel against authority if the authority is putting into place good things. And we can extrapolate from political authority into your workplace. Your boss, the person that you report to at work. We can extrapolate into family authority. All right. So I want you to think this morning about the authority figures in your life. The people that, that you are called to, to honor, to, to obey, to honor God as a result of you being obedient to God by being obedient to those authorities. And I want you to think about your particular situation. Is there a struggle in those relationships? Is there questions about how are you to respond to that authority? Maybe some of you are dealing with issues where there is corruption. There is a lack of integrity. There is downright sin that's happening. And maybe that is causing you to wonder how are you to respond to this authority that's over you. And so it's interesting that Solomon says, whoever obeys his commands will come to no harm. The assumption here is obedience to commands that are right, upright. But then he says this, the wise heart will know the proper time and procedure. For what? For addressing those issues that you know in your heart are not right. You can't sit with this. Something has to be done. He follows this up in verse six, for there is a proper time and procedure for every matter. This harkens back to Ecclesiastes chapter three. There is a season for everything. A part of wisdom, having the spirit of God in our lives is discerning when and how to address these sensitive issues that may involve people that are very close to us. Family members, a boss at work. Those are close relationships to navigate. So he says in verse six, for there is a proper time and procedure for every matter, though a person may be weighed down by misery. So these situations have, a, have an oppressing effect on one's life. So here's where I'm going to trust the Holy Spirit, all right? I need to do this all the time. We all need to do this all the time. But in regard to the application of this particular section of Scripture, is there a struggle that you have in your life right now with someone who is an authority figure in your life? How is God asking you to honor him and the authority person? And it may involve speaking the truth in love. Let me give you one example. I read an, uh, an article a few days ago from a pastor of a church in Ukraine who's dealing with all kinds of dynamics with authority and politics and how all of this tragedy is unfolding in the country of Ukraine. Listen to what he writes. He says, as tensions have risen, our church announced a week of fasting and prayer, gather, gathering every night to bring our requests to God. For three days in a row, the lights were turned off in the city. We were forced to meet in the dark, adding a solemn atmosphere to our prayers for peace. At the end of the week, those moments produced in us an inner strength to persevere. Through communal prayers, we've gained confidence and peace. We believe God is with us, and that is the most important thing. During this critical moment, our church, which has about 1,000 people attending on a normal Sunday, is also a place of service. We've recently conducted several trainings on performing first aid. People are learning how to apply a tourniquet, stop bleeding, apply bandages, and manage airways. These lay people aren't going to become doctors, but this has given them confidence to care for their neighbors if necessary. 
In fact, when I first announced the first aid training, one brother told me, now I know why I need to stay in Ukraine. He had planned to leave. He knew he wasn't a soldier. He wasn't able to take up arms and fight, but he now wants to stay to help the wounded and to save lives. If necessary, the church premises can be turned into a shelter. We have a good basement. We're ready to deploy a heating station as well as provide a place for a military hospital. To make this a reality, we're creating response teams. If martial law is declared, we're ready with a strategic supply of fuel, food, and material for dressing wounds. We've even gathered information on who in the church are doctors, mechanics, plumbers, even who has wells in case of a water shortage. We have decided to stay both as a family and as a church. When this is over, the citizens of Kiev will remember how Christians have responded in their time of need. And while the church may not fight like the nation, we still believe we have a role to play in this struggle. We will shelter the weak, serve the suffering, and mend the broken. And as we do, we offer the unshakable hope of Christ and his gospel. As we stay, we pray the church in Ukraine, Ukraine will faithfully trust the Lord and serve our neighbors. I found that incredibly powerful a powerful witness of who the church is called to be in the midst of very trying times. But let's bring it back down to your situation. Your trying time now might be a struggle with someone in authority. And it may not be a governmental issue, it may be a workplace issue or a family issue. This church prayed and God gave them confidence and boldness and is giving them wisdom. As we pray this morning, we're trusting that God will give us confidence, boldness, and wisdom to know the time and the way, the procedure for those conversations that may need to be had so that Christ can be honored in all things. Which leads me to now to our first 60 second moment of silent prayer. Let's bow and let's pray. Point number two, God wants us, me and you, right, to trust him when we are struggling with questions about the future. Look at verse seven. Since no one knows the future, who can tell someone else what is to come? As no one has power over the wind to contain it, so no one has power over the time of their death. As no one is discharged in time of war, so wickedness will not release those who practice it. Going back to verse 7, since no one knows the future, who can tell someone else what is to come? Let me ask you a question right now. As you reflect on this past week, what about the future has caused you unsettledness, anxiety, worry, a sense of angst. It may be hard to just identify a few because we're human beings, right? Who are seeking to walk in the power of the Spirit and yet we take back so many worries and cares and concerns of this world where the Bible says to cast those on Jesus, the one who died for us on the cross, yet we have a tendency to want to hold those concerns and those worries. Because quite frankly, a lot of times we think we can manage the situations better than God can. Which goes back to what I said at the beginning, a lot of times we want to manage God. A futile task, by the way, if you've ever tried to do that. But what are those things? 
And now I want you to just listen to the words of Jesus. In our men's group on Wednesday morning, we read a portion of this text because it's powerful and it's right in the middle of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus' sermons were all powerful, but Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is just incredible in how it speaks to the hearts of people today. Jesus said, Why do you worry about what you're wearing? Clothing. See how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor or spin. I've never personally seen a flower that's going to work. Never heard a flower speak, I gotta get up and make the donuts, right? A flower is a flower growing out of the ground with all of its beauty and all of its splendor because of its creator, God. They do not labor or spin, Jesus says, yet I tell you that not even Solomon, here Jesus actually references Solomon, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you, Jesus says, of little faith. This is what Jesus put in the middle of his sermon. And so when I worry, I'm a man of little faith, Jesus says. When you worry, you are a person of little faith. And we need to remember this because the situation in the world is not going to get better. It's going to just get worse in many ways. And so we can do daily heart checks. If we sense a little anxiety or a little worry welling up into our hearts, or if we think we can manage our lives better than God can manage them, then we need to remember what Jesus says to us in those moments. Mark, right now in this moment, because you're carrying the weight of this world and you're worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow, you are a man of little faith. I don't want to be a man of little faith. I don't think you want to be characterized as a person of little faith. And we all go through seasons where we struggle, and a struggle is a part of the Christian life. But the overall trajectory of our lives in Jesus is not to be one that's marked by worry, anxiety, and little faith. And so Solomon says, no one knows the future except God. Who can tell someone else what is to come? Only God knows the full story on past, present, and future. And so here's the bottom line question for point number two. What are you most tempted to worry about for this coming week? What are you most tempted to worry about in this coming week? You're going to get 60 seconds right now to give it up. Let's bow. Point number three, God wants us to trust him when we are struggling with yet another issue, and that issue is injustice. God wants us to trust him when we are struggling with injustice. Look at verse nine. All this I saw as I applied my mind to everything done under the sun. There is a time when a man lords it over others to his own hurt. Then too I saw the wicked buried, 
those who used to come and go from the holy place and receive praise in the city where they did this, this too is meaningless. Verse 10, if you wanted to write one word next to verse 10, it would be hypocrisy. Solomon talks about wicked people coming to the place of worship and leaving that place, receiving praise for how on the outside maybe it looks like they are so righteous and yet the inner core of their lives, lives are not righteous at all. So there's this hypocrisy that's mentioned in verse 10. Verse 11, when the sentence for a crime is not quickly carried out, people's hearts are filled with schemes to do wrong. Although a wicked person who commits a hundred crimes may live a long life, I know that it will go better with those who fear God, who are reverent before him. Yet because the wicked do not fear God, it will not go well with them, and their days will not lengthen like a shadow. There is something else meaningless that occurs on earth. The righteous who get what the wicked deserve, and the wicked who get what the righteous deserve. We've all been in situations in our lives where we have sought to do the right thing with all of our heart. Prayed about it trusted God, we've moved out, we've done the right thing, and the result was not fun or pretty, and it seemed rather unjust. This is what Solomon is talking about. The righteous people who seem to get a bad, bad deal with life, and then wicked people who don't seem to care at all about the Lord or living in an obedient way and sometimes it can seem that everything just seems to go right for them and so we've all assessed these kinds of things we've all been on the receiving end of injustice and maybe some of you right now are walking through some relational territory where you have been investing and investing in a righteous way. And you have just been receiving nothing good in return. God knows the pain. God knows the suffering and, and the emotional stress that that can bring. And so there is a call in this text to trust him. Verse 14 again. There is something else meaningless that occurs on earth. The righteous who get what the wicked deserve and the wicked who get what the righteous deserve. This too, I say, is meaningless. So I commend the enjoyment of life because there is nothing better for a person under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad. Then joy will accompany them in their toil all the days of the life God has given them under the sun. I want you to notice that Throughout the challenging strain of what we're seeing in this passage this morning, there is this call to joy. Joy in the midst of injustice and suffering. There is this call to enjoy God's gracious gifts in the moment. And we've seen this theme over and over and over again in Ecclesiastes. And it's almost as if you and I need to be regularly reminded to stop and to realize God's grace in the moment, as hard as life can be sometimes, as challenging as it is, and to enjoy God's presence, to enjoy the presence of God's people, and to encourage each other in this journey of life, which has many struggles along the way. And so I want you to consider what areas of injustice you may be experiencing in your life. Maybe you've been trying to do the right thing and it doesn't seem to be working out very well. We have to remember about God's timetable. That it's going to work out perfectly in his time and he calls us to continue to press on. Seeking him, following him, and doing the right thing. Being disciples who seek to live that life of integrity in this world. The greatest biblical example of this apart from Jesus experiencing injustice when he was seeking to be righteous is the person of Job, which is also a wisdom book from the pages of the Old Testament. 
And Job was a righteous man. He was blameless before God, and yet he was stricken with all of these different tragedies and challenges. Job had his questions, right? God, what are you up to? What are you doing? And I think it's very powerful how God responded to Job's questions. And on the back, or on the bottom of your bulletin, excuse me, I've listed some of the questions that God asked Job when Job was asking God questions about what is going on. And we've all asked questions of God, what is going on? That's the theme of this morning. Look at some of the questions that God asks Job, and he asks us as well when we question him. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? So God asked me, Mark, where were you when the world was created? Uh, okay. Mark, have you journeyed to the springs of the sea? Or walked in the recesses of the deep. You know those areas in the depths of the ocean where there is no light? Where the creatures that live there are scary looking? But yet beautiful in another way because you know that each one is this unique creation of God? Where the water temperature is like 35 degrees? The pressure is incredible. Yet there are creatures living there. And when I have a tendency to want to manage God, God asks me, just like he asked Job, Hey, Mark, have you taken a stroll down there recently? Okay. Do you send the lightning bolts on their way? For those who live in Central Florida, you know, we know the power of lightning. We've tried at this church to protect things from the damaging effects of lightning bolts. And as much as we've tried, we've even unplugged things so that nothing would happen. And we've had lightning strikes so close to this building that even devices that have been unplugged have been destroyed by electrical current. And as frustrated as I've gotten by that, when I read Job, it's sort of like, okay, God, I wanna get that message. You're greater. <laughs> Your power cannot be contained. Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? When we lived in New Mexico, we would take teenagers hiking in the mountains in central New Mexico. And if you get far enough away from civilization, inevitably, we would see elk, and deer, goats. And isn't it amazing to think of all the mountain ranges around the globe God knows every time a mountain goat gives birth. Every time an elk gives birth, God knows about that. It would blow our minds if we had just a fraction of the information that God has. But he knows. Do you have an arm like God's? And can your voice thunder like his. God responds to Job's questions with some poignant, pointed, strategic questions. And I am challenged by that, just like Job was challenged by that. <clears throat> to hold up one's arms in worship and praise and adoration and to just trust him. In unjust situations, trust him. To have wisdom to navigate relationships that are strained and working out how to deal with an authority figure, to trust him. Laying our worries before him for anything that this next week may be just like a hamster wheel in our brain. Where we're trying to take control of an uncontrollable situation and an uncontrollable future. God says, do you know? How many mountain goats right now are giving birth? Because I do. So your Monday, Mark, it's in good hands. It's covered. It's going to be okay. We're going to end by singing a worship chorus that um, most of you probably don't know. So I'm going to invite whoever's going to participate this morning in this last song to come on up. 
And uh, Angela, if you can put the lyrics of this song on the screen, I just want to walk through this briefly. Um, all right, so the first stanza is holy. You are still holy, even when the darkness surrounds my life. As a part of Ecclesiastes is, is navigating this, this darkness that we find around us. Sovereign, you are still sovereign even when confusion has blinded my eyes. Go to the next slide, please. Lord, I don't deserve your kind affection. None of us do. This is grace. When my unbelief has kept me from your touch, because we've all struggled, let's face it this morning, when things have gotten hard, we've all struggled with unbelief, lack of faith, right? I want my life to be a pure reflection of your love. Jesus quoted Psalm 22 when he was on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Paraphrase, what is going on, right? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. It's powerful to me that our Savior, in his moments on the cross, was crying out Psalm 22. Then verse 3 says this. Yet, you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you, they cried out and were saved. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. In our questions, we worship. When we are thinking, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why am I in this unjust situation? What am I going to do with this relationship? I'm freaking out about the future. We worship. We worship a holy God because he is enthroned and knows it all. And he loves us so much that he gave up his life 